Here we are. We can start the second part on this morning, and I'm absolutely pleased and honored to introduce to you Professor Rainer Straub, who will uh, give you this lecture also this morning and also in the first part of the afternoon. This uh, first lecture will be part of the general introduction to, to psychoneuroimmunology and uh, neuroimmunopharmacology, and this afternoon it will be part of the section dedicated to autoimmune disease. And so just a few information about Professor Straub. Professor Straub graduated in medicine in Freiburg, and then he was postdoctoral fellow uh, in Freiburg, in Regensburg, and in Vienna. He is specialist in internal medicine, in rheumatology, and clinical immunology, and he is uh, a consultant immunologist. And uh, his uh, present position is head of the laboratories of the Department of Internal Medicine at the University Hospital of uh, Regensburg. He is professor of experimental medicine at the Department of Internal Medicine of the University of uh, Regensburg. And uh, as I already told you, he is involved uh, in the main uh, scientific societies in the field of uh, psychoneuroimmunology, and in particular, uh, he was part of the executive committee of the International Society of Neuroimmunomodulation. He was president and member of council of the Psycho Neuroimmunology Research Society and uh, um, president, uh, coordinator, and promoter of the GABIN, uh, German Endocrine Brain Immune uh, Network. He's in the editorial board uh, of uh, some of the main uh, uh, journals, uh, international journals, uh, both in the field of psychoneuroimmunology and in particular of uh, rheumatology, which is his main field of research, and in particular, for instance, of brain behavior and immunity, neuroimmunomodulation, uh, clinical and experimental rheumatology, arthritis and rheumatism, rheumatology in the Journal of Endocrinology, and a lot of other um, papers. He's just with us um, uh, after uh, a very recent uh, sabbatical leave at the University of California in San Diego at the Division of uh, Rheumatology, Allergy, and uh, uh, Immunology. And uh, uh, Last but not least, uh, after all these uh, positions, he is also a very, very good friend of us, and I'm really very honored and pleased to welcome him and to thank him to have accepted his invitation, notwithstanding uh, all his uh, uh, commitments, in particular in this period. And so again, thank you very much, Rainer, and please give us your, our, your lecture. Marco, thank you very much. Um, one of the first things that you have to learn is that one of the most important things in science is friendship. And I, I, I guess that uh, my colleagues on, in the first row would say the same. Friendship, and you will find friends in science, external, uh, uh, in other countries, international friends. And I think... I think from a personal point of view, science is important, and uh, particularly for the young, but the friendship, and I have a very good one with uh, Marco uh, and uh, Franca, and I think this is an important starting point, and thank you for the invitation. So, now we come to the science part. I'm talking about circadian rhythms and inflammation in the first uh, part. Now see... When you treat a patient with prednisolone, which is a glucocorticoid, um, this was done, for example, here, um, prednisolone, then you expect that the disease gets better. It's very clear. And one of the signs that you can look at is, for example, morning stiffness. These patients, when they get up in the morning, they have stiff fingers and, and they cannot move the fingers. And they can, if they want to, to, to move the mouse, they would do it like this, and they cannot, cannot um, just do their usual duties in the kitchen or somewhere else. So this is called morning stiffness. And if you give prednisolone to these patients, then you reduce the morning stiffness. The, uh, as you can see here, the starting point of the therapy was here, and after six months, there was a clear reduction in the morning stiffness from 120 minutes stiffness uh, down to approximately 40 minutes stiffness, which is a, a, has an effect size of what, approximately 50%. Okay, it's not completely gone, but it's fine. 
Why do I talk about this fact? When we look on the circadian rhythm of stiffness, the stiffness can be tested in the patient um, over time. And you see that it is different during the day. So this is the 5 o'clock in the afternoon, 9 o'clock in, uh, in, in the evening, 1 in the night, 5, 9, and 1 o'clock in the afternoon the next day. And you see how strongly the stiffness in these patients, these are also patients with arthritis, changes over the time. What this tells us very clearly, and the size, the effect size, is nearly different as, as I mentioned before. Um, the effect size of 50% with the therapy and the effect size of the daily variation is very similar, 40% uh, effect size. And the pain is also rising, and you see the rise is always in the morning, in the morning hours, this is the night, this is the night, this is the night, and in the morning hours, the patient get stiff, they have more pain, and they have more disability. The disability can be tested if, you, if they take a little um, pearl, and they try to bring the pearl into a little tube. So take the pearl and bring it into the tube, um, and then you, you stop the time. You stop, you measure the time, and they, if, you, if, they, if they have problems, they take much longer, and uh, this way they can test the disability. And you see it's always in the morning hours, always in the morning hours. So we call this stiffness morning stiffness. Yeah. The morning, but <clears throat> the stiffness, of course, and pain and disability has something to do with inflammation, you will see later. Strong influence. How it does, and it looks like, a, we call this a circadian rhythm. And how does a circadian rhythm work? The circadian rhythm um, is, a, is dependent of, on the Earth's daily light and dark cycle. It is not exactly required for the circadian rhythm, but it, you will see in a later, one of the later slides, it's, it's coordinated by the light cycle. The light-dark cycle in a way, resets the circadian system every day. And the intrinsic human rhythm, if you would not have the day and the light, light and dark cycle, you would have an intrinsic rhythm of approximately 24 hours, exactly 24 hours. And this is similar for, a, for the drosophila. The drosophila, without light and without dark, has a rhythm of 23.7 hours, so very similar. And the circadian rhythm also exists in fungi, bacteria, algae, worms, plants, and many others. And even, even in our body, single cells um, like blood cells or cardiomyocytes or lung cells or hepatocytes have their own circadian rhythm. The entire system is regulated by a circadian, in a circadian way. The circadian rhythm is produced in a small nucleus in the brain, in the hypothalamus. This is the hypothalamus. This is the pituitary gland. And uh, you see the hypothalamus. And here, in this so-called nucleus, or suprachiasmaticus, or suprachiasmatic nucleus, the red one here, there the rhythm is generated. This is a cross-section. You see the cross-section. Here's the chiasma the, from the nervous opticus. Um, and over the chiasma, there is this nucleus. Okay, the man who, or the group who found the circadian rhythm was Moore at the beginning of the 70s, um, where he knocked out or where he deleted, or, 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 or how can I say, how, how, um, he um, injected alcohol into these areas, and by injecting the alcohol into the area, he found exactly when he uh, destroyed the area where the circadian rhythm comes from. So this was extremely important work in, at the beginning of the 1970s. Now when we take out a, no, a neuron of this, of this uh, nucleus uh, in the brain and you bring these cells into the culture dish, the cells start to produce a circadian rhythm on themselves, a spontaneous circadian rhythm. You can see this has the 24-hour um, period another 24 hours, another 24 hours, another 24 hours, or so more or less uh, a 24-hour circadian rhythm. 
And the, the people who studied this in, in 1997, uh, they looked at the, the firing rate of these neurons. So you, you um, put in a little electrode into the neuron, and you can measure the electrical changes of, uh, of the membrane potential, and this has been done uh, in these experiments. <coughs> so this system in the brain um, <coughs> is closely linked to certain molecules, and exactly this was in 1984, was the first area in the genes where people found um, a gene that was responsible in the drosophila for the circadian rhythm, and this was called the period locus. And in later time, the period locus um, <coughs> possessed several genes, uh, one of which is now called period one, two, and three. So this was in the, in the drosophila, and uh, this was later in the mammal, in the mouse. Um, it uh, had a little different position in the mouse. It segregated as a single gene um, to the mid portion of the mouse chromosome 5, a region synthetic, synthetic of human chromosome 4. So they were very close together. So these molecules or these proteins on these or these genes responsible for the proteins were anyhow involved in the regulation of the circadian rhythm in these neurons that I mentioned before. So in the human, we now know <coughs> uh, several of these genes um, on chromosome 1 is period uh, 3, period 2 is uh, on chromosome 2, BMAL is another protein relevant in these circadian rhythms, cryptochrome, uh, timeless, cryptochrome 1 and 2, and period homologue 1 uh, is on chromosome 17. So very diverse and different chromo chromosomes, very diverse, but these factors are linked to the circadian rhythm, and I explain it now how this works. This is a beautiful story, um, which is really, from my point of view, um, uh, deserves a Nobel Prize, by the way, uh, because this is uh, a highly sophisticated work over the last 20, 25 years, starting with that very orig original work of Moore and, and the group. So how does it work? A clock and a BMAL, they bind to the e-box of promoter of the period um, gene. And if they bind, they are activating the, uh, the transcription and translation uh, later on of um, a one of period and uh, the periods. And the periods themselves uh, uh, start to inhibit the binding of clock and BMAL to the e-box. And this rhythm of binding and inhibi uh, inhibition and binding and inhibition um, is dependent on the degradation of these um, molecules. And the entire system is undulating in a 24-hour way. So there are two systems. This is um, uh, this part where, the, where they have the clock and the BMAL relevant on the e-box with the periods and the cryptochromes and ref uh, alpha. And on the other uh, hand, we have this, the second system, which is uh, ROA alpha, uh, that activates uh, BMAL1. BMAL1 is here again and uh, puts, uh, sits on this side. And the ref -up alpha on this side is the inhibitory pathway on this side. So the ent entire system is regulated in a way that we have a circadian rhythm, rhythm over for, uh, 24 hours. This is the way I mentioned this. These are so-called shell neurons. They're sitting in this, uh, in this center of the brain, in the shell, and in the core neurons, the, uh, there is the influence from the light that is coming from the retina. And there's a special retino-hypothalamic tract, uh, which is not in the, in the macula in the, in, in the eye, the, 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 the area of the strongest uh, focus, but somewhere around in the periphery. And this retino hypothalamic tract um, per permits the signals via glutamate, substance P, and PCAP to induce in the core neurons a, me a mechanism that is switched on via CMP, PKA, and CREP, inducing period one, which then releases uh, other neuropeptides which influence the shell neurons and altogether build the system of the circadian rhythm. So, the synchronization with the external light is done by the retino hypothalamic tract over these core neurons, and they influence the endogenous rhythm of the 
shell neurons, and altogether they release important neurotransmitters to, and these are linked, these neurotransmitters, to different targets in the central nervous system. So, when we take out the neurons once more, we take out neurons and we look, for example, here on period one expression, um, then you see that these neurons are different in a way. Uh, for example, the red neuron is, a, is similar like this, this blue neuron. They are very early, but with a phase shift of approximately an hour, and a third neuron is coming up and is also firing. And you see this is always the same, always the same. When you block protein production in the cell, then you completely shut down the rhythm of this, uh, of this uh, machinery. And then it comes up again, and you see now they are synchronized, very well synchronized. But after a certain while, you see that again, the rhythm starts again in a similar way like at the beginning. So the entire system is regulating e each other. Um, the neurons are regulating each other and building within the cell the circadian rhythm, and externally they influence each other to, to uh, produce the circadian rhythm for the entire body. So. Here are the links, the links to uh, different um, areas in the central nervous system and in the periphery. Once more, the, the, the rhythm is coming from the suprachiasmatic nucleus, and this is linked to the sleeping centers, to arousal centers, waking up in the morning, to feeding centers, and to pain processing centers in the brain. So depending on the rhythm, you have different effects on feeding. For example, you feed yourself in the morning hours and in lunchtime, and others do it more in the lunchtime and in the evening. So you have uh, individual rhythms. They are linked, of course, to these different uh, uh, centers in the brain. But also the hormones to the endocrine system, the, uh, the, the, the circadian rhythm and the nucle uh, supraglossomatic nucleus is tightly linked, for example, to the hypothalamus to the paraventricular nucleus of the hypothalamus and there to the hormones corticotropin, adrenocorticotropin, but also to thyreotropin, releasing hormone, and thyreotropin, the th thyroid stimulating hormone, the growth hormone, releasing hormone, and the growth hormone. And another system is the paraventricular nucleus of the hypothalamus with the gonadotropin releasing hormone and the luteinizing hormone and the follicle stimulating hormone. So this is the, the, the sexual, the gonadal aspect, um, also tightly linked to the circadian rhythm. To the supraoptic nucleus, and this is adiuretin, oxytocin, and to the pineal gland with melatonin. And finally, to the peripheral nervous system, and here, uh, the best things are known for the sympathetic nervous system. So it's, for example, well known that lipolysis in the body is dependent on the circadian rhythm. And uh, the um, activity of the adrenal medulla is also linked to the sympathetic nervous system. Similarly, the thyroid gland and the liver and, of course, sympathetic nerve endings. And as Marco uh, Cosentino already mentioned, the sympathetic nerve endings are now in close contact to immune cells, for example, in lymphoid organs like the spleen or like uh, l uh, the, 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 the uh, uh, lymph nodes. And by this context, one can expect that there might be a modulation of peripheral cells um, via sympathetic nerve fibers in these um, organs in these lymphoid organs, secondary lymphoid organs, and primary lymphoid organs. I have to take a little water. Wait a second. At the moment, I have a little problems with my circadian rhythm because I've been in the United States for two weeks and came back in at Thursday, which makes jet lag, as you know. And this night, for example, I slept only four hours. And uh, my, my water uh, need is much higher than usual. I don't know why, but I drink like uh, it has something to do with this. I'm just very sure. So we go on. You can imagine when we have these links from the brain to the periphery, we might have some changes also of the immune system because these important hormone systems and neural systems have links to the immune system. And now you might understand that 
the symptoms that we talked about at the beginning, the symptoms with the stiffness, which is a factor of inflammation, is anyhow linked to this. Yes, we know since a long time that cortisol is a strong inhibitor of cytokines. Yeah, you agree. I hope you agree. You agree. <laughs> you agree. Good. Okay. Most of you make this here. Um, another one is that the activation of the sympathetic nervous system, if it is strong enough, I say this particularly, if it is strong enough, meaning with high concentrations of these neurotransmitters, um, inhibits, for example, the tumor necrosis factor via beta-2 adrenergic receptors. Oh, that's fine. You don't care if I drink from the bottle, no? No, no. It's good from the bottle. It's water. Yeah, it's fine. It's water. Italian water. Very good one. Okay. So, active um, increase of cortisol and sympathetic activity inhibits um, pro-inflammatory cytokines. And we could call it anti-inflammatory. And we have also hormones, on the other hand, that increase tumor necrosis factor. This is work, for example, from, uh, of uh, Giorgio Maestroni, who was mentioned this morning. But also prolactin increases cytokines. And growth hormone is a very, very strong stimulator of the immune system. So these are in red. And when I paint something in red for the entire morning and, and afternoon, red means pro-inflammatory. And green means anti-inflammatory. Okay. So now, with this knowledge, keep it in mind, keep this in mind, we go, we, we, we observe the circadian rhythm of different hormones and cytokines. Already, and now with the first view on the circadian rhythm of the serum cortisol, and look on the left side first, healthy controls have a circadian rhythm that looks like this. You see, this is the night time. And during the nighttime, the early phase in the nighttime, the, the levels of cortisol are very low. And in the morning, they are high. And you see what a big change between 40% of the 24-hour mean average value. The 24-hour the uh, uh, mean value is 100%. So then you uh, imagine that there is a 100% line here, 100% line. And how strong the change is, it goes down 60%, and it goes up from here another um, 60 to 80 percent into the other direction. So big changes of this hormone, big changes. And as you can see here, is that oh, as you can see, uh, yeah, see here, this is the concentration in the blood between 100 and 300 nanomole. 100 is this here, and 300 is something here, here at the top. So a big change. Okay. Now we look on a on a group of patients with inflammatory diseases, those patients with the stiffness in the, in the hands. And those patients have rheumatoid arthritis. You heard about this disease. This is a disease where the small joint in the, in the hand and the feet, and particularly it's uh, this, these joints, the metacarbophalangeal joints. No, these are the metacarbophalangeal joints. These are the, uh, the proximal interphalangeal joints. It's the wrist, the wrist. And it's a little the elbow, a little the shoulder. And it's the same uh, on, the, on the leg. They are swollen, big swollen. And in the swelling, these, um, the cells that enter in, into the tissue are from all sorts, mm, uh, macrophages, uh, um, or monocytes, macrophages, are uh, neutrophils, uh, T cells, uh, B cells, uh, mast cells, whatever. They are all in the joint. And they activate locally the joint and destroy the joint. This is the problem. If you do nothing, nothing, that people have destroyed joints within one year. So this is the situation. And these patients now, as you can see, they have a very, very similar rhythm like the healthy controls. No big changes. OK. No big changes. And as you can see here, the concentration in the blood is also relatively similar in these patients. No big difference. So the stiffness might not come from changes in the serum cortisol concentration. Okay. Further on, when we look on the melatonin, le melatonin level, the, the melatonin has the peak uh, in the early night. When you go to bed, you see that there is immediate sharp rise of melatonin. You see, very sharp rise goes up, 
and has a peak somewhere in the night at 1, 2 o'clock in the night here. And this is similar in the rheumatoid arthritis patients. This is not so high, but th this uh, is probably not the big difference between the two. The rhythm in itself is similar. It comes a little later, the peak, probably at 4 o'clock. Here it's 3 o'clock, but that's not a big difference. With prolactin, it's similar. Prolactin is also a night hormone. Again, a night hormone comes up in er when you start sleeping, and you see uh, how big that change is, and it remains high during the entire night. And when you wake, it goes the opposite direction. So the pro-inflammatory hormone of melatonin and prolactin increase immediately after the beginning of the sleep. It's the same in rheumatoid arthritis patients. And interestingly now, there is also a circadian rhythm of cytokines. And you would not expect this, because pr primarily you would not expect it, because the cytokine is not released from a nerve fiber or is not released from an endocrine gland, but is released from immune cells. So when you see this rhythm, rhythm now, with also with a similar maximum in the morning hours and a rise during the night and a fall in the morning, which is, by the way, um, uh, no, we, we can see here, um, this, this tells you that this suprachiasmatic nucleus in the brain must have a link to the immune system. This is more or less a proof. This is the, one of the best proofs that exist from my point of view. Um, so in, now there's a big difference between a uh, rheumatoid arthritis patient and the, the, the healthy controls because here the concentration in the blood in the healthy controls is 2 to 4 picograms per ml. You measure that in the blood. And in the rheumatoid, it's 20 to 40 picogram per ml. And it cl clearly tells you here is much more inflammation in the rheumatoid arthritis patient compared to the healthy. And in addition, you see here the, the, the fall of the IL-6 in the morning hours happens very fast in the healthy. And already at 8 o'clock in the morning, 9 o'clock in the morning, they are down on a low level. This is probably, probably the phase when we are happy again. When you start in the morning and you have a little uh, high IL-6 levels, you probably don't feel very well. But when then uh, this fall comes, it's getting better. And this is not the same in a rheumatoid arthritis patient. You see, that is, m that is much broader, and it goes down in the later time, at 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock. Here, it goes down. So they have a longer morning morning uh, duration of high IL-6 values. And this might be linked to the stiffness. Okay? We have, we d d have not fully answered that question, but it might be linked at this point. So what we think at the moment is a kind of uh, system where the cytokines influence the hormones and the hormones influence the cytokines so that they they paint each other every day. And I go back once more to the IL-6. In the, in the night, when the cortisol values are very low, and I mentioned this before, the ver they were very, very low here in the night, at the beginning of the night, IL-6 rises. Prolactin goes up. Melatonin gets up. And all of those uh, factors might stimulate the immune system in the healthy control, also in the rheumatoid arthritis patient. And when the cortisol is very high in the morning again, when it's very high, then the cortisol in the morning blocks and inhibits uh, the cytokine interleukin-6 in these morning hours. And this is certainly a little different between the healthy and the rheumatoid arthritis patients. And it could be, show, when you think of the, uh, the difference between the two, looking on the serum cortisol, there was no difference. But looking on the cytokine levels, there's a big difference. So probably the amount of cortisol in the rheumatoid arthritis patients is not high enough, not strong enough, to suppress the stronger immune response in the inflammatory patients, where you have much, much higher values in the serum and somewhere else. And we call this this missing uh, increase of cortisol, we call this the inadequate response of the adrenal glands. Okay, they paint each other, and they uh, do that every day, every night, every day, and every night, and then when you have a jet lag, you make a big alteration in the system, and probably you have high cytokines at, at a certain time point where you don't want to have high cytokines. Probably now is the reason why I drink so much water. And... Um, and um, 
cortisol is low. Pro maybe it's n now it's low. This is a pity, but uh, it should be much higher. Then I would be even better. <laughs> but what is the bigger meaning behind the circadian rhythm? Is there a bigger meaning? Why do we do this? Why do we do it? Any ideas from the from the audience? Any good idea? Say it in Italian and Marco translates. The Drosophila has it. The fungi has it. The mammals have it. It's evolutionary, positively selected system. It's a system that has been conserved during evolution. Here are some strong discussions between these ladies. Do you have a good idea? And we can say in Italian. Probably not for spending too much energy. What I mean, for? during the night you don't have so to spend energy so much. Mm -hmm. So uh, maybe there is a system to switch off uh, mm -hmm. the energy consuming. Uh, it has something to activity. do with the energy. Very good. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Very good. Um, I I paint it like this. We have in the body three major energy consuming systems. The energy consuming system of the brain with uh, needs in the day approximately 2,000 kilojoules per day. And we have the muscles with 2,500 kilojoules. When we sit like you sit now, do you need 2,500 or more? But when you make a marathon or you make a Tour de France bicycling, then it's much higher, of course, of course. Um, and we have the immune system, which needs approximately 1,600, and when it is moderately activated, moderately activated, it needs also 2,000. So 2,000, 2,000, and 2,500. And now you can activate one of the systems. For example, the bicyclist of the Tour de France, he needs per day approximately 15 to 20,000 kilojoules. Huge amount, huge amount, huge amount. Um, the entire body but, uh, in a Tour de France cyclist needs 30,000, 30 mille. Yeah? Um, this is a lot. And the body, the gut, the gut can take up 20,000, 20 mille. Not more. Cannot take up more. So the Tour de France bicyclist must stop every, every third day. If he don't, don't stop, he cannot make it. He needs infusions. Uh, they, they don't do that, I think. They stop and... Uh, uh, they, they don't take infusions. Hopefully not. Okay. And the brain, the brain is not so, not so various. The brain can need up to 2,500. For me, example, from, from my po uh, point of view, today I need 2,500, 2,800 because I have four talks. My brain needs a lot today. Um, and also the muscles. They need also a lot. And the immune system can be activated. Of course, when you have sepsis, for example, the immune system can go up here to five to 6,000 kilojoules. So in a situation where the uptake in the gut is limited, you have not a, a full uptake for thousands and thousands of kilojoules in the gut. You have a limited uptake. You have to share the energy in the body between big systems. Yeah? It's like in a society, when you pay tax, and you want to share the tax. And you share it between different systems. And it's exactly the same. I, but the difference is between the society and the politicians and the body is that the body is well, well trained in sharing. It's absolutely mandatory to share the energy reserves. This is not the same with the politicians. They don't think about that. And they might make, make kind of prior, prioritizing to one or the other thing, and this is not the usual way to do it. But no allusions to your country, it's the same in our country. <laughs> of course, Rainer, if I can say, it's, uh, for, for, for our country is also different because our country has also a problem of energy collection. Yeah. What about tax paying? <laughs> not only tax sharing. No critics, not critics to Italy. I like this country very much, you know. So, so when we have this sharing, this sharing is done via circadian rhythms. During the day, 
The HPA axis is activated in the morning, and the sympathetic nervous system with their hormones, adrenaline, noradrenaline, cortisol, and glucagon, if you, if you like. And after the meals, you increase insulin. But don't think of the, in, uh, of the increase after the meals. Just think of these here. And they are immunosuppressive. I mentioned this before. Cortisol and the, uh, the sympathetic nervous system are immunosuppressive. So they suppress, they can suppress during the day, they can suppress the immune system, but they do other things. They induce lipolysis, breakdown from fat in the fat tissue. They make better oxidation of the fatty acids. So they take the fat, fatty acids from the tissue and make energy out of it, RTP out of it. They make glucogenolysis. They take the stores of glucose. The glucogen is the store of glucose, break it down, and they can do it. And they make protein breakdown and they induce ketone bodies, and they are responsible for leukocyte redistribution. So they send out the leukocytes. Hey, come on, leukocytes, go, go, it's morning time, and in the morning time, you need uh, circulating leukocytes. They don't do much, but they circulate, and they enter the tissue. So in the night, and you see here, the, the, the brain is important, the muscle, and they need all these good things. In the night, it's a little different. In the night, all these anti-inflammatory hormones are low, and some important pro-inflammatory hormones are painted in red, again, and pro-inflammatory. Prolactin, melatonin, and growth hormone come up, and they stimulate the immune system. They stimulate in the night the antigen presentation, clonal expansion, antibody production, cytokine production. Cytokine production, by the way, is the increase of IL-6 during the night. You've heard the increase, 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 yeah? This is exactly a thing what happens. And they support growth and repair, which is, of course, age-dependent. And particularly, growth hormone is responsible for the gluconeogenesis and ketone bodies. And with these energy-rich fuels, the system is activated in the night with growth hormone. And when you have children, you don't have children probably, but uh, if you will have, you say to your children, go to bed. And if you go to bed, the growth hormone goes up. So if they go to bed and sleep well, they become bigger. Probably in Italy, you, you don't sleep uh, that very well and long. That is not so good uh, because growth hormone is so important and you, you, need, you need to let your children sleep in the evening. And you need a high amount of growth hormone. Otherwise, the growth in the night doesn't work very well. So, now we have an understanding of the circadian rhythm and the bigger meaning behind it. Now we go back to rheumatoid arthritis. This is a patient with rheumatoid arthritis. You hear the metafarb uh, carbophalangeal uh, joints, and they are swollen. This is, look, doesn't look normal, right? Here you see big swelling edema. Edema is the word for it. And you see it also a little here, not too much, not too much, but it's particularly in this area. And you see here a, 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 a kind of uh, um, superimposed picture where in the reddening zones there are swellings, as you can see here, swellings in the different areas. So one of the major factors responsible for the swelling and for the edema formation is substance P. Substance P is a, a, um, a neuropeptide from the pain fibers. And when you, when um, substance P is released into the tissue, then it leads to vasodilation. And the partner of uh, substance P is calcitonin gene-regulated peptide. And both together lead to vasodilation. And they are important for the edema formation. It's a program. It's an adaptive program, evolutionarily positively selected for an acute inflammation. And we call this neurogenic inflammation, this very rapid inflammatory um, reddening, swelling is neurogenic inflammation, and the main factor is substance P. And with the uh, activation of the sensory nerve endings, the sensory nerve endings can be activated in the periphery via cytokines, via prostaglandins, bradykinins, and other factors. And with the activation of these, we stimulate in the spinal cord and in the periphery, the substance P release and the pain processing to the, to the brain. So when these cytokines influence the activity of the sensory nerve endings, then it becomes clear, very clear, 
that they that these uh, rhythms of the, cy of the cytokines are linked to the pain rhythms and to the swelling and to the edema rhythms and to the stiffness rhythms. And the swelling and uh, is coming from vasodilation and edema formation, I mentioned that. So now we start to understand why we have stiffness in the morning, pain in the morning, and disability in the morning in these patients. Because the cytokines come up during the night, cortisol is low, and when cortisol comes up in the morning, it goes down, and at approximately 1 o'clock, they reach a relatively low level, and it's similar for pain, and it's similar for disability, and it has a big effect size. And the effect size is as big as a therapy. Like a drug. And if you investigate a patient in the morning hours, let's say this a patient is in a, in a big clinical trial, a therapeutic trial, and the patient comes to you at 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock, and you say, hey, uh, signore, whatever, what is your morning stiffness? And he says, oh, not good this morning, not good. And he says, one hour, two hour, etc., etc. But when the same patient comes in the afternoon, yeah, he says, ah, oh, I feel well, no stiffness. And so it's extremely important when you interview the patient during a clinical trial, Usually in the clinical trials, this is not, not uh, respected. They come during the entire day, it doesn't matter. It makes a huge variation, makes a huge variation, and is extremely important. So, the beautiful thing with the circadian rhythms is that we have a new therapy, which is based on circadian rhythms. Um, as I mentioned before, the cytokines go up in the night. Yeah, you see it here. This is the night time. The cytokines go, go up. Responsible are prolactin, growth hormone, melatonin, and the low levels of uh, cortisol and the sympathetic nervous system. So they go up and they fall. Here are the candidates. And they stimulate cells, and the cells stimulate each other. It's always the, always the case. When you sit in, in, with your colleagues in a, in, a, in a group and one has a good idea, then he says, I have a good idea here, a good idea. And the other says, oh, I have another good idea and another good idea. And so you stimulate each other. And this is the same way how cells influence each other when they sit together. And when they produce a pro-inflammatory factor like tumor necrosis factor, then they inactivate other cells around and other cells around. And if they do it more and more and more and more, then you have the rising, the rise of the tumor necrosis factor during the night. And all of that is stimulated by the hormones, growth hormone, prolactin, melatonin, and of course, with in the presence of low cortisol. Why do I talk about that? Every little cell has its own secretion curve of TNF. And the secretion curve of TNF is looking like this has a time frame of approximately one and a half hour, goes up and goes down. If, there the st if, there the st if the stimulus comes here, then the stimulus leads to an increase of, of this cell. And when you have two cells, you have the two cells. And if you have four cells, you have four cells. And if you have eight cells, you have eight cells. And then you have an envelope curve of the TNF. The envelope curve shows you the rise of the en entire thing. It's an integral over time, more or less. An integral, and you can see here, this is the integral. And when you, inf when you in want to influence an immune cell that is activated, you better do it at the beginning. If it's on the top level, you cannot much influence an immune cell anymore, because then the protein is already produced, the protein is in, in vesicles, the protein is going to be released immediately into the, into the vicinity of the cell, and you cannot change that much. The, the most important changes you do at the very beginning. And a classical example for that is cortisol. Co when you activate a cell and you give concomitantly cortisol, then you have a much better inhibitory effect if, if you do it at the end. Because this cortisol effect is a very, very fast effect at the beginning because the translation machinery should not be activated. Um, for example, cortisol activates I kappa B the inhibitory aspect of the NF-kappa-B. NF-kappa-B is a strong pro pharma uh, transcription factor. And if this happens very early, this happens in the first 10, 15 minutes, then I-kappa-B goes up, 
and I, uh, a high I kappa B blocks the NF kappa B. That is a thing that happens in the first uh, period. So ma the mainly all factors that can influence the inflammatory process have to go in the early phase. So all, in all these cells, if you do a therapy very early here at the beginning, yeah, then it's better uh, as uh, when you do it at the end in the, in the falling flank. And with respect to all the different cells, it would be very nice if we can increase the glucocorticoids here in the night at 2 o'clock or 3 o'clock. We don't do that. Of course, we sleep. Don't wake your patient. But the patients are clever. Patients are very clever because some patients already recognize that it's much better for them if they take the prednisolone in the night and they, they, they take the, the clock, they put uh, the, the watch, uh, the, uh, and, uh, they uh, regulate the watch, and they wake up at 2 o'clock, take the prednisolone, and sleep on. And, with this and this idea came mainly from the patients in the, in the 1990s. And uh, the first study has been done by Swedish colleagues, um, the man who made it was Dr. Arvidsson, and he tested it in patients. And this has now been co uh, uh, continued by colleagues in Germany who produced a new form of a tablet. And this new tablet, uh, you take it in the evening at 10 o'clock, and all of a sudden in the night at 2 o'clock, it breaks up, it breaks up, and it releases the prednisolone, and this makes a beautiful a beautiful inhibition of rheumatoid arthritis, and it makes a beautiful inhibition of morning stiffness. And when you go into this paper of Frank Butgereit in Lancet in 2008, you will exactly see how that works, and it has a superb effect, I can tell you. And it also decreases the serum interleukin-6, which clearly shows that the therapy at the right time point has a strong effect on this uh, circadian rhythm of the cytokines. So... I summarize, and then I have five to ten minutes for questions. And some of you uh, prepare a question? You prepare a question? Yeah? Well, perhaps you have a question. There were already some questions. Okay, summary. The circadian rhythm is generated in the central nervous system. The nucleus suprachiasmaticus is linked to the periphery by hormones and our autonomic nervous system. The circadian rhythms of cytokines is known and immune activation and we know the circadian rhythms of symptoms and it's very clear that with all this we can clearly see how the brain is nicely linked to the immune system how the immune system is modulated by the brain and from there we came with a new treatment with modified release corticosteroids that are released in the night because it better blocks the cytokine increase i thank you for your attention <laughs>